Inflationary Depressions and Currency Crises In the previous section, we looked at the archetypal deflationary debt crisis, which we created by averaging the 21 deflationary cycles you can review in Part 3. We will now look at the archetypal inflationary debt crisis, which we created by averaging the 27 worst cases of inflationary cycles, also shown in Part 3. After reviewing this template, I encourage you to read about the hyperinflation in Germany's Weimar Republic, which is examined in depth in Part 2, to compare it to the archetypal case described here. Before we turn to the charts and other data, please remember that currency and debt serve two purposes, to be one, mediums of exchange and two, storeholds of wealth. Debt is one person's asset and another's liability. Debt is a promise to pay in a certain type of currency, example, dollars, euro, yen, pesos, etc. Holders of debt assets expect to convert them into money and then into goods and services down the road, so they are very conscious of the rate of its loss of purchasing power, i.e., inflation, relative to the compensation, i.e., the interest rate, they get for holding it. Central banks can only produce the type of money and credit that they control, example, the Fed makes dollar-denominated money and credit, the BOJ makes Japanese yen money and credit, etc. Through a symbiotic relationship, over time central banks and free market borrowers and lenders typically create bigger and bigger piles of debt assets and debt liabilities. The bigger the pile, the greater the challenge for central bankers to balance the opposing pressures so the pile doesn't topple over into a deflationary depression in one direction or an inflationary depression in the other. Policy makers, those who control monetary and fiscal policies, can usually balance these opposing forces in debt crises because they have a lot of power to redistribute the burdens so they are spread out, though they can't always balance them well. Central banks typically relieve debt crises by printing a lot of the currency in which the debt is denominated, which, while stimulating spending on investment assets and the economy, also cheapens the value of the currency, all else being equal. If a currency falls in relation to another currency at a rate that is greater than the currency's interest rate, the holder of the debt in the weakening currency will lose money. If investors expect that weakness to continue without being compensated with higher interest rates, a dangerous currency dynamic will develop. That last dynamic, i.e., the currency dynamic, is what produces inflationary depressions. Holders of debt denominated in the poorly returning currency are motivated to sell it and move their assets into another currency or a non-currency store hold of wealth like gold. When there is a debt crisis and economic weakness in a country, it is typically impossible for the central bank to raise interest rates enough to compensate for the currency weakness, so the money leaves that country and currency for safer countries. When so much money leaves the country that lending dries up, the central bank is faced with the choice of letting the credit markets tighten or printing money, which produces a lot of it. While it is widely known that central banks manage the trade-offs between inflation and growth by changing interest rates and liquidity in the system, what is not widely known is that the central bank's trade-offs between inflation and growth are easier to manage when money is flowing into a country's currency slash debt and more difficult to manage when it's flowing out. That's because if there is more demand for the currency slash debt, that will push the currency slash debt prices up, which, all else being equal, will push inflation down and growth up, assuming the central bank keeps the amount of money and credit steady, when there is less demand, the reverse will happen. How much changing demand there is for a country's currency slash debt will create changes in the currency versus changes in interest rates will depend on how the central bank moves its levers, which I'll cover below. For now, suffice it to say that in times when money is flowing out of a currency, real interest rates need to rise less if real exchange rates fall more, and vice versa. Capital outflows tend to happen when an environment is inhospitable, example, because debt, economic, and or political problems exist, and they typically weaken the currency a lot. To make matters worse, those who fund their activities in the country that has the weaker currency by borrowing the stronger currency see their debt costs soar, that drives down the weaker currency relative to the stronger one even more. For these reasons, countries with the worst debt problems, a lot of debt denominated in a foreign currency, and a high dependence on foreign capital typically have significant currency weaknesses.
the currency weakness is what causes inflation when there is a depression. Normally this all runs its course when the currency and the debt prices go down enough to make them very cheap. More specifically, the squeeze ends when a, the debts are defaulted on and or enough money is created to alleviate the squeeze, b, the debt service requirements are reduced in some other way, example, forbearance, and or c, the currency depreciates much more than inflation picks up, so that the country's assets and the items it sells to the world become so competitively priced that its balance of payments improves. But a lot depends on politics. If the markets are allowed to run their courses, the adjustments eventually take place and the problems are resolved, but if the politics get so bad that productivity is thrown into a self-reinforcing downward spiral, that spiral can go on for a long time. Which countries slash currencies are most vulnerable to severe inflationary deleveragings or hyperinflations? While inflationary depressions are possible in all countries slash currencies, they are far more likely in countries that don't have a reserve currency, so there is not a global bias to hold their currency slash debt as a storehold of wealth. Have low foreign exchange reserves, the cushion to protect against capital outflows is small. Have a large foreign debt, so there is a vulnerability to the cost of the debt rising via increases in either interest rates or the value of the currency the debtor has to deliver, or a shortage of the availability of dollar-denominated credit. Have a large and increasing budget and or current account deficit, causing the need to borrow or print money to fund the deficits. Have negative real interest rates, i.e., interest rates that are significantly less than inflation rates, therefore inadequately compensating lenders for holding the currency slash debt. Have a history of high inflation and negative total returns in the currency, increasing lack of trust in the value of the currency slash debt. Generally speaking, the greater the degree to which these things exist, the greater the degree of the inflationary depression. The most iconic case is the German Weimar Republic in the early 1920s, which is examined at length in Part 2. If you are interested in reviewing actual case studies showing the reasons why inflationary depressions happen rather than deflationary ones, it is worth noting the differences between the Weimar case study and the U.S. Great Depression and 2007-2011 case studies, which are also examined in Part 2. Can reserve currency countries that don't have significant foreign currency debt have inflationary depressions? While they are much less likely to have inflationary contractions that are as severe, they can have inflationary depressions, though they emerge more slowly and later in the deleveraging process, after a sustained and repeated overuse of stimulation to reverse deflationary deleveraging. Any country, including one with a reserve currency, can experience some movement out of its currency, which changes the severity of the trade-off between inflation and growth described earlier. If a reserve currency country permits much higher inflation in order to keep growth stronger by printing lots of money, it can further undermine demand for its currency, erode its reserve currency status, example, make investors view it as less of a store hold of wealth, and turn its deleveraging into an inflationary one. The Phases of the Classic Inflationary Debt Cycle Classically, inflationary deleveragings follow the ebbs and flows of money and credit through five stages that mirror the stages of deflationary deleveragings, but that are different in important ways. Over the past few decades I have navigated through a number of inflationary deleveragings and researched many more. They transpire pretty much as deflationary deleveragings do up until the fourth stage, the depression. I'll begin this section with a look at the stages of the archetypal inflationary deleveraging, just as I did in the prior section. This archetype was created by averaging 27 inflationary deleveragings in which there was a lot of debt denominated in foreign currencies. Then I'll compare the archetype to four specific hyperinflationary cases in order to highlight their differences. 1. The early part of the cycle. In the healthy upswing, Favorable capital flows are a result of good fundamentals, i.e., because the country is competitive and there is potential for productive investment. At this point, debt levels are low, and balance sheets are healthy. That stimulates export sales and hence foreign capital, which funds investments that produce good returns and yield productive growth. Capital flows, both within countries and among them, are typically the most important flows to watch because they are the most volatile. 
As the cycle begins, debt and incomes rise at comparable rates and both debt and equity markets are strong, which encourages investing, often with borrowed money. The private sector, government, and banks start to borrow, which makes sense for them because incomes are rising quickly, making it easier to service the debt. These strong fundamentals and early levering up set the country up for a boom that in turn attracts more capital. The positive, self-reinforcing cycle is enhanced when the demand for the currency is improving. If the currency is cheap enough to offer attractive opportunities to foreign investors, who will typically lend to or invest in entities that can produce inexpensively in that country and sell into export markets to earn the foreign currency to provide them with a good return, and or the country sells more to foreigners than it buys from them, a country's balance of payments will become favorable, i.e., the demand for its currency will be greater than its supply. This makes the central bank's job easier, i.e., it can get more growth per unit of inflation, because the positive inflows can be used to appreciate the currency, to lower interest rates, and or to increase reserves, depending on how the central bank chooses to handle it. At these times of early currency strength, some central banks choose to enter the foreign currency exchange market to sell their own currency for the incoming foreign currency in order to prevent it from rising, and to prevent the adverse economic effects of its rise. If the central bank does this, it needs to do something with that newly acquired currency, which is to buy investment assets denominated in that foreign currency, most typically bonds, and put them in an account called foreign exchange reserves. Foreign exchange reserves are like savings, they can be used to bridge imbalances between the amount of currency demanded and the amount supplied by the free market in order to cushion the movements of the currency markets. They can also be used to purchase assets that might be desirable investments or offer strategic returns. The process of accumulating reserves is stimulative to the economy because it lessens the upward pressure on their own currency, which allows a country to maintain stronger export competitiveness and puts more money in the economy. Since central banks need to create more money to buy the foreign currency, doing that increases the amount of domestic currency funds to either buy assets, causing asset prices to rise, or lend out. At this juncture, the currency's total return will be attractive because either a, those who want to buy what the country has to offer need to sell their own currency and buy the local currency or b, the central bank will increase the supply of its own currency and sell it for the foreign currency which will make the country's assets go up when measured in its own currency. So, during this time when a country has a favorable balance of payments, there is a net inflow of money that leads to the currency appreciating and or the foreign exchange reserves increasing. This influx of money stimulates the economy and causes that country's markets to rise. Those invested in the country make money from the currency return, through a combination of currency price changes and asset return differences, and or the asset appreciation. The more the currency appreciates, the less assets will appreciate. 2. The bubble. The bubble emerges in the midst of a self-reinforcing virtuous cycle of strong capital flows, good asset returns, and strong economic conditions. The capital that came in during the early upswing produced good returns, as it was invested productively and led to asset price appreciation, which attracted even more capital. In the bubble phase, the prices of the currency and or the assets get bid up and increasingly financed by debt, making the prices of these investments too high to produce adequate returns, but the borrowing and buying continues because prices are rising, and so debts rise rapidly relative to incomes. When there is a big wave of money coming into, and or staying in, a country slash currency, typically the exchange rate is strong, foreign exchange reserves increase, and the economy booms, or in some cases the currency rises a lot and the economy grows more slowly. This upswing tends to be self-reinforcing until it is so overdone that it reverses. It is self-reinforcing because the inflows drive up the currency, making it desirable to hold assets denominated in it and desirable to hold liabilities denominated in other currencies, and or produce more money creation that causes prices to rise more. In either case, during these bubbles the total returns of these assets to foreigners, i.e., asset prices in local currency plus the currency appreciation, are very attractive. That plus that country's hot economic activity encourage more foreign inflows and fewer domestic outflows.
Over time, the country becomes the hot place to invest, and its assets become overbought so debt and stock market bubbles emerge. Investors believe the country's assets are a fabulous treasure to own and that anyone not in the country is missing out. Investors who were never involved with the market rush in. When the market gets fully long, leveraged, and overpriced, it becomes ripe for a reversal. In the bullets here and in the ones that follow, we show some key economic developments typically seen as the bubble inflates. Foreign capital flows are high, on average around 10% of GDP. The central bank is accumulating foreign exchange reserves. The real FX is bid up and becomes overvalued on a purchasing power parity, PPP, basis by around 15%. Stocks rally, on average by over 20% for several years into their peak. All sorts of entities build up structurally long currency positions because there is constant reward for doing that. Most participants are motivated to be long the currency of the country that is enjoying a sustained wave of investment into it, though they often find themselves in this position without explicitly taking it on or fully recognizing it. For example, foreign businesses that set up operations in the hot country might fund their activities with their own currency to keep the liability in the currency that they expect will be weaker, but they might prefer to hold their deposits in the local currency, and they might not hedge the currency exposures that come from the revenues of sales in that country. Similarly, local businesses might borrow in the weaker foreign currency, which the foreign bankers are eager to lend because the market is hot. There are lots of different ways that a sustained bull market will lead to multinational entities getting long that local currency. The influx of foreign capital finances a boom in consumption. Imports rise faster than exports, and the current account worsens. Meanwhile, investment in the country creates strong growth and rising incomes, which make borrowers in the country more creditworthy, and make them more willing to borrow at the same time that lenders are more willing to lend to them. High export prices, usually for commodities, increase the country's income and incentivize investment. As the bubble emerges, there are fewer productive investments, and at the same time there is more capital going after them. The fundamental attractiveness of the country that sparked the boom fades, in part because the rising currency is eroding the country's competitiveness. During this stage, growth is increasingly financed by debt rather than productivity gains, and the country typically becomes highly reliant on foreign financing. This shows up in foreign currency-denominated debt rising. These emerging countries typically borrow primarily from abroad with debts denominated in foreign currencies because of a combination of factors, including the local financial system not being well developed, less faith in lending in the local currency, and a smaller stock of domestic savings available to be lent out. Asset prices rise, and the economy is strong. This creates both higher levels of spending in the economy and higher levels of obligations to pay in foreign currency in order to make debt service payments. As with all debt cycles, the positive effects come first and the negative effects come later. Debt burdens rise fast. Debt to GDP rises at an annual rate of about 10% over three years. Foreign currency debt rises on average to around 35% of total debt and to around 45% of GDP. Typically, the level of economic activity, i.e., the GDP gap, is very strong and growth is well above potential, leading to tight capacity, as reflected in a GDP gap of around plus 4%. The charts below convey what happens to debt and the current account in the average of the 27 inflationary deleveraging cases, which we call the archetype. Just as I did with the deflationary deleveraging archetype charts, I highlight each of the stages, with the zero point on the charts representing the top in economic activity. Classically, during the bubble, debt as a percentage of GDP rises from around 125% to about 150%, and the current account deteriorates by about 2% of GDP. During the bubble, the gap between the country's income and its spending widens. The country requires an increasing inflow of capital to drive continued growth in spending. But levels of economic activity can remain strong at the top of the cycle only as long as continued inflows, motivated by expectations of continued high growth, drive up asset prices and cause the currency to strengthen further.
At this point, the country is increasingly fragile and even a minor event can trigger a reversal. Below we summarize the conditions through the upswings that led to the 27 inflationary deleveragings we looked at. We break out the cases with higher and lower levels of foreign denominated debt and the cases that eventually had the least and most extreme economic outcomes, as measured by most severe declines in growth and equity prices and increases in unemployment and inflation. As you will see, the countries that were most externally reliant through the upswing and experienced the biggest asset bubbles ultimately experienced the most painful outcomes. 3. The top and currency defense. The top reversal slash currency defense occurs when the bubble bursts, i.e., when the flows that caused the bubble and the high prices of the currency level, the high asset prices and the high debt growth rates finally become unsustainable. This sets in motion a mirror opposite cycle from what we saw in the upswing, in which weakening capital inflows and weakening asset prices cause deteriorating economic conditions, which in turn cause capital flows and asset prices to weaken further. This spiral sends the country into a balance of payments crisis and an inflationary depression. Because at the top people are so invested in the optimistic scenario, and because that optimism is reflected in the prices, even a minor event can trigger a slowing of foreign capital inflows and an increase in domestic capital outflows. Though worsening trade balances typically play a role, usually because of the high currency level and excessive domestic consumption that led to high imports, adverse shifts in capital flows are usually more important. The circumstances that could set off such a crisis are akin to what might set off financial difficulties for a family or individual, a loss of income or credit tightening, a big increase in costs, such as rising gasoline or heating oil prices, or having borrowed so much that repayment becomes difficult. Any one of these shocks would create a gap between the amount of money coming in and the amount of money being spent, which has to be closed somehow. In the typical cycle, the crisis arises because the unsustainable pace of capital that drove the bubble slows, but in many cases, there is some sort of a shock, like a decline in oil prices for an oil producer. Generally the causes of the top reversal fall into a few categories. The income from selling goods and services to foreigners drops, example, the currency has risen to a point where it's made the country's exports expensive, commodity exporting countries may suffer from a fall in commodity prices. The costs of items bought from abroad or the cost of borrowing rises. Declines in capital flows coming into the country, example, foreign investors reduce their net lending or net investment into the country. This occurs because the unsustainable pace naturally slows. Something leads to greater worries about economic or political conditions, or a tightening of monetary policy in the local currency and or in the currency those debts are denominated in, or in some cases, tightening abroad creates pressure for foreign capital to pull out of the country. A country's own citizens or companies want to get their money out of their country slash currency. Weakening capital flows are often the first shoe to drop in a balance of payments crisis. They directly cause growth to weaken because the investment and consumption they have been financing is reduced. This makes domestic borrowers seem less creditworthy, which makes foreigners less willing to lend and provide capital. So, the weakening is self-reinforcing. Growth slows relative to potential as the pace of capital inflows slows. Domestic capital outflows pick up a bit. Export earnings fall, due to falling prices or falling quantities sold. Typically exports are flat, no longer rising. The shift in capital and income flows drives asset prices down and interest rates up, slowing the economic growth rates that were dependent on the inflows. This worsens the fundamentals of companies and further drives out capital flows. The economy suffers a debt bust, asset prices fall and banks fail. During this stage, worry increases on the part of both asset-slash-currency holders and the policymakers who are trying to support the currency. Asset-slash-currency holders typically worry that policymakers will impose restrictions on their ability to get their money out of the country, which encourages them to get their money out while they still can, which further increases the balance of payments problem. Policymakers worry about capital outflows and the possibility of a currency collapse. As the balance of payments deteriorate, 
the central bank's job becomes more difficult, i.e., it gets less economic growth per unit of inflation because the negative flows lead the currency to depreciate, interest rates to rise, and or reserves to decline, depending on how the central bank chooses to handle it. At this stage, central banks typically try to defend their currencies by a, filling the balance of payments deficit by spending down reserves and or b, raising rates. These currency defenses and managed currency declines rarely work because the selling of reserves and or the raising of interest rates creates more of an opportunity for sellers, while it doesn't move the currencies and interest rates to the levels that they need to be to bring about sustainable economic conditions. Let's look at this typical defense and why it fails. There is a critical relationship between a, the interest rate difference and b, the spot slash forward currency relationship. The amount the currency is expected to decline is priced into how much less the forward price is below the spot price. For example, if the market expects the currency to fall by 5% over a year, it will need that currency to yield a 5% higher interest rate. The math is even starker when depreciation is expected over short periods of time. If the market expects a 5% depreciation over a month, then it will need that currency to yield a 5% higher interest rate over that month, and a 5% monthly interest is equivalent to an annual interest rate of about 80% 10, a level that's likely to produce a very severe economic contraction in an already weak economy. Because a small expected currency depreciation, say 5 to 10% in a year, would equal a large interest rate premium, 5 to 10% per year higher, this path is intolerable. Said differently, a managed currency decline accompanied by falling reserves causes the market to expect continued future currency depreciation, which pushes up domestic interest rates, as described above, acting as a tightening at a time when the economy is already weak. Also, the expectation of continued devaluation will encourage increased capital withdrawals and devaluation speculation, widening the balance of payments gap and forcing the central bank to spend down more reserves to defend the currency, or abandon the planned gradual depreciation. Also, a currency defense by spending reserves will have to stop because no sensible policymaker will want to run out of such savings. In such currency defenses, policymakers, especially those defending a peg, will typically make boldly confident statements vowing to stop the currency from weakening. All of these things classically happen just before the cycle moves to its next stage, which is letting the currency go. It is typical during the currency defense to see the forward currency price decline ahead of the spot price. This is a consequence of the relationship between the interest rate differential and the spot slash forward currency pricing that I discussed above. To the extent that the country tightens monetary policy to try to support the currency, they are just increasing the interest rate differential to artificially hold up the spot currency. While this supports the spot, the forward will continue to decline relative to it. As a result, what you see is essentially a whip-like effect, where the forward tends to lead the spot downward as the interest rate differential increases. The spot then eventually catches up after the currency is let go, and the fall in the spot exchange rate allows the interest differential to narrow, which mechanically causes the forward to rally relative to the spot. At this point in the cycle, capital controls are a third, often last-ditch, lever that seldom works. They can seem attractive to policymakers, since they directly cause fewer people to take their capital out of the country. But history shows that they usually fail because a, investors find ways to get around them and b, because the very act of trying to trap people leads them to want to escape. The inability to get one's money out of a country is analogous to one's inability to get one's money out of a bank, fear of it can lead to a run. Still, capital controls sometimes can be a temporary fix, though in no case are they a sustained fix. Usually, this currency defense phase of the cycle is relatively brief, in the vicinity of six months, with reserves drawn down about 10 to 20 percent before the defense is abandoned. 4. The depression, often when the currency is let go. As mentioned above, a country's inflationary deleveraging is analogous to what happens when a family has trouble making payments, with one major difference. Unlike a family, a country can change the amount of currency that exists, and hence, its value. 
That creates an important lever for countries to manage balance of payments pressures, and it's why the world doesn't have one global currency. Changing the value of the currency changes the price of a country's goods and services for foreigners at a different rate than it does for its citizens. Think about it this way, if a family's breadwinner lost his, her job and would have to take a 30% pay cut to get a new one, that would have a devastating economic effect on the family. But when a country devalues its currency by 30%, that pay cut becomes a 30% pay cut only relative to the rest of the world, the wages in the currency the family cares about stay the same. In other words, currency declines allow countries to offer price cuts to the rest of the world, helping to bring in more business, without producing domestic deflation. So after supporting the currency in unsustainable ways, i.e., expending reserves, tightening monetary policy, making very strong assurances that there will not be a devaluation of the currency, and sometimes imposing foreign exchange controls, policymakers typically stop fighting and let the currency decline, though they generally try to smooth its fall. Here is what we typically see after policymakers let the currency go. The currency has a big initial depreciation, on average declining around 30% in real terms. The decline in the currency is not offset by tighter short rates, so that the losses from holding the currency are significant, on average, around 30% in the first year. Because the decline is very severe, policymakers try to smooth it, leading them to continue to spend down reserves, on average, by another 10% for a year into the bust. Central banks should not defend their currencies to the point of letting their reserves get too low or their interest rates too high relative to what is good for the economy because the dangers those conditions pose are greater than the dangers of devaluation. In fact, devaluations are stimulative for the economy and markets, which is helpful during the economic contraction. The currency decline tends to cause assets to rise in value measured in that weakened currency, stimulate export sales, and help the balance of payments adjustment by bringing spending back in line with income. It also lowers imports, by making them more expensive, which favors domestic producers, makes assets in that currency more competitively priced and attractive, creates better profit margins for exported goods, and sets the stage for the country to earn more income from abroad, through cheaper and more competitive exports. But currency declines are double-edged swords, how policy makers manage them greatly impacts the amount of pain the economy must endure during the adjustment. The nature of the currency decline greatly impacts how much inflation increases and how the inflationary depression plays out. In all inflationary depressions, currency weakness translates to higher prices for imported goods, much of which is passed on to consumers, resulting in a sharp rise in inflation. A gradual and persistent currency decline causes the market to expect continued future currency depreciation, which can encourage increased capital withdrawal and speculation, widening the balance of payments gap. A continual devaluation also makes inflation more persistent, feeding an inflation psychology. That's why it's generally better to have a large, one-off devaluation that gets the currency to a level where there's a two-way market for it, i.e., where there isn't broad expectation that the currency will continue to weaken so people are both buying and selling it. This means higher inflation is less likely to be sustained. And if the one-off devaluation isn't expected by the market, i.e., it's a surprise, then policymakers won't have to spend reserves and or allow interest rates to rise to defend the currency going into the devaluation. This is why policymakers generally say they'll continue to defend the currency right up until the moment they stop doing it. After policymakers first let the currency go, stinging savers and creating expectations slash fears of further devaluation, people push to get out of their positions in the currency. Many people had likely acquired big asset liability mismatches, taken on because they were profitable at the time. That makes the reversal self-sustaining, because when the currency weakens, the mismatches all of a sudden go from being profitable to unprofitable. When the capital is no longer available, the spending is forced to stop. Even those who aren't borrowing from abroad are impacted. Since one person's spending is another person's income, the effects ripple through the economy, causing job losses and still less spending. Growth grinds to a halt. Lenders, especially domestic banks, have debt problems.
foreigners become even less willing to lend and provide capital. Typically capital inflows dry up, falling fast, by more than 5% of GDP in less than 12 months. Capital outflows continue, at a pace of minus 3 to minus 5% of GDP. Typically the pullback in capital is not offset much by the central bank printing money, as printing risks enabling more people to get out of the currency, worsening capital flight. Weaker growth causes investors to pull their money out anyway, the assets that had been seen as a fabulous treasure a short time ago now look like trash. They quickly go from overbought to oversold and prices plummet. Nominal short rates rise, typically by about 20 percentage points, and the yield curve inverts. Printing is limited, 1-2% to of GDP, on average. Equities in local currency terms fall, on average by around 50%. They perform even worse in foreign currency terms, as the currency decline exacerbates the equity sell-off. One of the most important asset-slash-liability mismatches is foreign-denominated debt. As their local currency depreciates, debtors who owe foreign currency debt face a rising debt burden, in local currency. There is not much that borrowers can do, so they typically sell local currency to pay back debts, put on hedges, and move more savings into foreign currency, all of which contributes further to the cycle of downward pressure on the local currency. Debt service rises further, on average by more than 5% of GDP, because incomes fall and foreign currency-denominated debt service becomes higher when measured in local currency, further squeezing incomes and spending. FX debt burdens rise on those who borrowed in foreign currency, Debt to GDP rises on average by about 20% from the decline in incomes and the currency. The currency declines also push up inflation as imports become more expensive. Inflation rises, typically by 15%, peaking around 30%. Inflation stays elevated for a while, on average for about two years from the top. During this phase, the pendulum swings from most everything looking great to most everything looking terrible. Different types of problems, debt, economic, political, currency, etc., reinforce each other. Hidden problems like fraudulent accounting and corruption typically come to the surface during such times. This bad environment discourages foreign money from coming in and encourages domestic investors to get their money out of the country. This is when countries usually hit the bottom. The bottom is the mirror opposite of the bubble stage. While investors during the bubble are aggressively getting in, investors during the catharsis are aggressively getting out. Those losing money in asset and currency positions flee from them in a panic, those who have been thinking of getting in don't want to go near the place, so a big supply-slash-demand imbalance occurs in which a shortage of buyers and surplus of sellers drive prices lower. This is the most severe and painful part of inflationary deleveraging, as the downward spiral is self-reinforcing and rapid. Hitting bottom is typically so painful that it produces a radical metamorphosis in pricing and policies that ultimately produces the changes that are needed to turn things around. That is why I use the word catharsis when describing hitting bottom. In theater, or for that matter, in one's own personal life, crisis sows the seeds for change and ultimately renewal. Because the currency has become very cheap, spending on imports is finally cut substantially enough to restore the balance of payments. That, plus, sometimes, international aid, example, from the IMF, BIS, and or other multinational organizations, creates the necessary adjustments. Often there are big political shifts, from those who have been pursuing fundamentally bad policies to those who will pursue economically sound ones. Here are some key economic developments that characterize this phase. The level of economic activity, GDP gap, falls a lot, on average by about 8%. Unemployment rises. The bottom in activity comes after about one year, with the trough in the GDP gap typically near minus 4%. 5. Normalization. The reversal and eventual return to normalcy comes when there is a balance between the supply and the demand for the currency relative to those of other currencies. While this balance is partially made via trade adjustments, 
it is typically more determined by capital flows, so it primarily comes when the central bank succeeds in making it desirable to hold the currency again, and secondarily when spending and imports have fallen sufficiently to bring about an adjustment in the balance of payments. So how can policymakers keep capital in the country by making it desirable to be long, encouraging people to lend and save in the currency and not to borrow in it? Most importantly, they need to produce a positive total return for the currency at an acceptable interest rate, i.e., at an interest rate that isn't too high for domestic conditions. While most people, including most policymakers, think that the best thing they can do is defend the currency during the currency defense phase, actually the opposite is true, because a currency level A, that is good for the trade balance, B, that produces a positive total return, and that C, has an interest rate that is appropriate for domestic conditions, is a low one. As explained earlier, the best way to bring that about is to let the currency depreciate sharply and quickly. While that will hurt those who are long that currency, it will make it more attractive for investors who will get long after the devaluation, because the total return on holding the currency, i.e., the spot currency appreciation plus the interest rate difference, is more likely to be positive, and at a sharply depreciated currency level it won't take an intolerably high interest rate to make the total return attractive. In other words, the best way to ensure that investors expect positive total returns going forward at a relatively low real interest rate, which is what the weak domestic conditions need, is to depreciate the currency enough.11. Both the balance of payments fundamentals and the central bank's willingness to control money printing and currency depreciations will determine whether the total return of the currency, i.e., the currency changes plus interest rate differences, will be positive or negative, which will influence the willingness to own or be short the currency. Devaluing currencies is like using cocaine, in that it provides short-term stimulation but is ruinous when abused. It's very important to watch what central banks do before you decide whether or not it's prudent to take a long position. If investors are burned with negative returns for too long and the currency keeps falling, that's frequently the breakpoint that determines if you're going to have an inflationary spiral or not. The central bank's objective should be to allow the currency to get cheap enough that it can provide the needed stimulation for the economy and the balance of payments, while running a tight enough policy to make the returns of owning the currency attractive. As you can see in the chart below, returns to holding the currency for foreigners start out negative, but then rally about a year after the devaluation. Even if the country as a whole hasn't hit its debt limits, frequently, certain entities within the country have, and policymakers must recapitalize systemically important institutions and provide liquidity in a targeted way to manage bad debts. By providing this targeted liquidity, typically by printing money, where needed, they can help avoid a debt crisis that could be contractionary or could cause additional rounds of capital flight, but the inflationary nature of this money printing needs to be balanced carefully. Here is what we typically see when the country reaches the bottom. The collapse in imports improves the current account a lot, on average by about 8% of GDP. Capital inflows stop declining and stabilize. Capital flight abates. Frequently, the country turns to the IMF or other international entities for support and a stable source of capital, especially when its reserves are limited. Short rates start to come down after about a year, but long rates continue to stay relatively elevated. After peaking, short rates fall back to their pre-crisis levels in around two years. The decline in short rates is stimulative. As interest rates come down, the forward currency price rallies relative to the spot. As the currency stabilizes, inflation comes down. Usually it takes nearly two years after the bottom for inflation to reach pre-crisis levels. Of course, these are all averages, and the actual amounts depend on each country's particular circumstances, which we will look at in the next section. The sizable and painful decline in domestic conditions also helps to close the balance of payments gap by bringing down spending and imports. Through the crisis, the average country's imports contract by around 10% as growth collapses and the equity market falls by over 50%. Classically, the collapse in imports brings the current account into a surplus of 2% of GDP, rising from a deficit of minus 6% of GDP about 18 months into the crisis.
In the earlier stages of the crisis exports play a smaller role, they actually tend to contract during the worst of the crisis, as other countries are sometimes seeing economic slowdowns too. They rebound in the subsequent years. Below, we provide a summary of what well-managed and poorly managed versions of these adjustments looks like. Managing the currency. Well-managed. Policy makers bluff, conveying that they will never allow the currency to weaken much. When they do devalue, it's a surprise. The devaluation is large enough that the people are no longer broadly expecting the currency weakening more, creating a two-way market. Poorly managed. Policy makers are widely expected to allow a currency weakness, causing more downward pressure on the currency and higher interest rates. The initial devaluation is small, and further devaluations are needed. The market expects this, causing higher interest rates and inflation expectations. Closing external imbalances. Well managed. Tight monetary policy causes domestic demand to contract in line with the fall in incomes. Policy makers create incentives for investors to stay in the currency, i.e., higher interest rates that compensate for risk of currency depreciation. Poorly managed. Policy makers favor domestic conditions, and monetary policy is too loose, putting off domestic pain and stoking inflation. Policy makers attempt to stop the outflow of capital with capital controls or other restrictive measures. Smoothing the downturn. Well managed. Use reserves judiciously to smooth the withdrawal of foreign capital while working to close imbalances. Poorly managed. Rely on reserve sales to maintain higher levels of spending. Managing bad debt slash defaults. Well managed. Work through debts of entities that are over indebted, making up the gap with credit elsewhere. Poorly managed. Allow disorderly defaults that lead to increased uncertainty and capital flight. Typically it takes a few years for the country to recover. Investors who were burned on their investments from the last cycle are reluctant to return, so it can take some time before capital inflows become strongly positive. But the price of domestic goods and domestic labor fell with the currency, so the country is an attractive destination for foreign investment and the capital starts to come back. Together, higher exports and foreign direct investment kickstart growth. If policy makers protect and recapitalize critical financial institutions, the domestic financial pipelines are in place to support a recovery. The country is back to the early part of the cycle and starts a new virtuous cycle where productive investment opportunities attract capital, and capital drives up growth and asset prices, which attracts more capital. Incomes and spending pick up, usually after about one to two years. It then takes several years, usually about three, from the bottom before the level of activity is back to average. The real FX is undervalued, typically by around 10% on a PPP basis, at the start of stabilization and stays cheap. Exports pick up a bit, by 1-2% to of GDP. Capital inflows start to return a few years later, on average 4-5. to five. Equities take about the same amount of time to recover in foreign currency terms. The spiral from a more transitory inflationary depression to hyperinflation. While in many cases policy makers are able to engineer a recovery in which incomes and spending pick up and inflation rates return to more typical levels, transitory balance of payments crises, a subset of inflationary depressions do spiral into hyperinflations. Hyperinflations consist of extreme levels of inflation, goods and services prices more than doubling every year or worse, coupled with extreme losses of wealth and severe economic hardship. Because these cases are more common than one might think, it is worth walking through how inflationary depressions spiral into hyperinflations. The most important characteristic of cases that spiral into hyperinflations is that policymakers don't close the imbalance between external income, external spending, and debt service, and keep funding external spending over sustained periods of time by printing lots of money. In some cases, it's not voluntary. Weimar Germany had a crushing external debt service burden, war reparations, that for the most part couldn't be defaulted on.
The amount of capital that needed to flow out of the country was so great that it was all but destined that Weimar would face big inflation problems, see our case study for more color. In other cases, policymakers choose to keep printing money to cover external spending, in effect, aiming to prop up growth rather than bringing spending in line with income. If this is done repeatedly over years and on a large scale, a country might face a hyperinflation that could have otherwise been avoided. As stated earlier, contrary to popular belief, it's not so easy to stop printing money during a crisis. Stopping printing when capital is flowing out can cause an extreme tightness of liquidity and often a deep economic contraction. And the longer the crisis goes on, the harder it becomes to stop printing money. For instance, in Weimar Germany there was literally a shortage of cash because the hyperinflation meant that the existing stock of money could buy less and less. By late October 1923, toward the end of the crisis, Germany's entire 1913 stock of money would have just about gotten you a one kilo loaf of rye bread. To stop printing would have meant there was so little cash that commerce would have virtually ground to a halt, at least until they came up with an alternate currency. In an inflation spiral, printing money can seem like the prudent choice at the time, but continuing to print money time and time again feeds the inflation spiral until there is no way out. How the spiral plays out. Over time, as the currency declines and printing is used more and more, people begin to shift their behavior and an inflationary psychology sets in. Currency declines inspire additional capital flight, which causes an escalating feedback loop of depreciation, inflation, and money printing. Eventually, the linkages that drove growth in earlier rounds decline and money printing become less effective. With each round of printing, more of the printed money is transferred to real or foreign assets instead of being spent on goods and services that fuel economic activity. Since investors that shorted cash and bought real-slash-foreign assets were repeatedly better off than those who saved and invested domestically, domestic currency holders shift from investing the printed money in productive assets to real assets, like gold, and foreign currency, in order to hedge inflation and a deterioration in their real wealth. Foreign investors stay away. Because the economy is weak and investors are buying real assets, stocks suffer and no longer provide the wealth effect that drove earlier rounds of spending. The result is a currency devaluation that doesn't stimulate growth. This dynamic is important to inflationary deleveragings, so we'll walk through it in detail. When continual currency declines lead to persistent inflation, it can become self-reinforcing in a way that nurtures inflation psychology and changes investor behavior. A key way this occurs is when inflation pressures spread to wages and produce a wage cost spiral. Workers demand higher wages to compensate for their reduced purchasing power. Compelled to raise wages, producers increase their prices to compensate. Sometimes this happens mechanically because of wage indexing, contracts in which employers agree to increase wages with inflation. As is normal in such cases of price and wage indexing, a vicious cycle is established, the currency depreciates, internal prices rise, the increase of the quantity of paper money once more lowers the value of the currency, prices rise once more, and so on. With each successive currency decline, savers and investors also change their behavior. Savers, who were burned before, now move to protect their purchasing power. They are quicker to short cash and buy foreign and physical assets. As inflation worsens, bank depositors understandably want to be able to get their funds on short notice, so they shorten their lending to banks. Deposits move to short-term checking accounts rather than longer-term savings. Investors shorten the duration of their lending, or stop lending entirely, because they are worried about risks of default or getting paid back in worthless money. During inflationary deleveragings, average debt maturities always fall. It's also cheap to short cash, as higher inflation and money printing lowers real interest rates, so the withdrawal of capital and faster borrowing cause illiquidity in the financial system. Banks find it practically impossible to meet the demand for cash. No longer able to fulfill their contracts because of cash shortages, businesses also suffer. At this point the choice for central banks, who remember the benefits of the previous round of currency declines, is between extreme illiquidity and printing money at an accelerating rate, 
and the path is again obvious, i.e., to print. They provide liquidity by printing money to support the banks and often lending directly to businesses. When interest rates are insufficient to compensate for future currency declines, this provision of liquidity provides the funds that enable investors to continue to borrow and invest abroad and in inflation hedges, like real assets or gold, which further contributes to the inflation and depreciation spiral. Because much of the country's debt is denominated in a foreign currency, debt burdens rise when the currency falls, which requires spending cuts and asset sales. While this effect was originally overcome by the stimulation of the falling currency, it becomes increasingly devastating as that effect fades and the debt burden grows. These higher debt burdens also mean foreign investors want higher interest rates as compensation for the risk of default. This means that currency declines and inflation often increase debt service and debt burdens, making it even harder to stimulate through the currency. Many governments respond to rising debt burdens by raising taxes on income and wealth. With their net worths already eroding because of the bad economy and their failing investments, the wealthy desperately try to preserve their rapidly shrinking wealth at all costs. This leads to extremely high rates of tax evasion and increases the flight of capital abroad. This is typical in deleveragings. As growth weakens further, the lack of foreign lending shuts down an important source of credit creation. And while there is a lot of domestic credit creation and borrowing, this borrowing does not result in much growth because so much of it is spent abroad on foreign assets. Of the spending that does occur locally, much of it doesn't contribute to GDP. For example, investors buy lots of gold, factories, or imports, even rocks in the case of the Weimar Republic, as storeholds of wealth. Capital investments like machinery and tools are purchased as stores of value, not because they were needed. It's easy to see how these forces can create a feedback mechanism that causes inflation and currency declines to escalate until people completely lose faith in the currency. Money loses its role as a store of value, and people hold at most a few days' reserves. The long list of zeros also makes it an impossible unit of account. Money also breaks down as a medium of exchange, because the currency instability makes producers unwilling to sell their products for domestic currency, and producers often demand payment in foreign currencies or barter. Because there is a shortage of foreign exchange, illiquidity reaches its peak and demand collapses. This form of illiquidity can't be relieved by money printing. Stores close and unemployment rises. As the economy enters hyperinflation, it contracts rapidly because the currency declines that were once beneficial now just create chaos. In addition to causing an economic contraction, hyperinflation wipes out financial wealth as financial assets fail to keep pace with currency depreciation and inflation. Hyperinflation also causes extreme wealth redistributions. Lenders see their wealth get inflated away, as do debtors' liabilities. Economic contraction, extreme wealth redistributions, and chaos create political tensions and clashes. Frequently public servants like police officers go on strike because they don't want to work for worthless paper money. Disorder, crime, looting, and violence typically reach their peak during this phase. In Weimar Germany, the government had to respond to the disorder by issuing a state of siege, granting military authorities greater power over domestic policies such as carrying out arrests and breaking up demonstrations. Investing during a hyperinflation has a few basic principles, get short the currency, do whatever you can to get your money out of the country, buy commodities, and invest in commodity industries, like gold, coal, and metals. Buying equities is a mixed bag, investing in the stock market becomes a losing proposition as inflation transitions to hyperinflation. Instead of there being a high correlation between the exchange rate and the price of shares, there is an increasing divergence between share prices and the exchange rate. So, during this time gold becomes the preferred asset to hold, shares are a disaster even though they rise in local currency, and bonds are wiped out. Once an inflationary deleveraging spirals into hyperinflation, the currency never recovers its status as a storehold of wealth. Creating a new currency with very hard backing while phasing out the old currency is the classic path that countries follow in order to end inflationary deleveragings.